Greetings to you and welcome to session 13 on the Gospel of Mark. I'm Pastor Timothy Muse, lead pastor at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Alliance, Ohio. And it's a joy to be with you today as we spend this time together. Thank you for your willingness to participate in this. Thank you for your willingness to be part of this study, part of the work that we do together. It is by your willingness, by your participation, by your investment that we're able to do the work that we do together. Uh, So thank you for that. Thank you for your willingness to to give time for this. I say this, you know, my podcast, and I say it often in other places, time is our greatest commodity. Time's our greatest gift. So the fact that you're investing time in this is really something truly special and really something truly incredible. So thank you for that. Thank you for giving of that. Thank you for, for sharing your time and your interest in the Bible. Thank you for sharing your interest in the Bible. You're listening to this because you are interested in the Word of God and studying it and growing it and experiencing. And so because of that, because of your interest, we all grow together. I get the chance to share and learn and study, and then I get the chance to take what I've learned and studied and share it with you. So thank you for that. Thank you for being part of the work that we do. Thank you for being part of this journey. And I really do truly appreciate this this incredible honor and opportunity. Uh, if you're listening to us for the first time, then welcome aboard. Uh, it's great to have you here. I certainly would encourage you to keep listening, even though, even though this is the 13th session. I certainly would encourage you to keep listening along. Uh, it, you will get a lot out of it. But then I would also encourage you to go back and listen to the previous sessions to know you know to follow up because we have been walking through this since the beginning of the book uh, on the gospel of mark so go back and catch up on the previous episodes starting you know with the beginning and how we've gotten to this point it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to do that they're all there on my youtube channel which i would recommend you subscribe to if you haven't already that way every time a new post or a new piece comes up then youtube will um, notify you of that so you know also as you look back you'll see that there's so many other opportunities and options in the study category i did do a piece on the gospel of john and prior to that the book of romans from paul and prior to that the book of revelation there's also some pieces on there about the nicene creed and about the lutheran church so so check that out check that out i invite you to go back and check out those things uh, but also follow along as we move forward and if you're returning thanks for coming back It's great to have you. It's great to have you come back. I hope that this session, like the previous sessions, is helpful for you and it gives you uh, things to be able to study and learn and grow and share. So I would encourage you to have a Bible open before you. It really doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a paraphrase or a translation. I use uh, the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. That's the translation that I work from. But you can use whatever translation or paraphrase, King James, New International Version, the Message, the Living Bible, the Good News Bible, whatever works for you. I just encourage you to have a Bible open. We don't spend enough time with the Bible open before us. This is one of our challenges in our modern world. There was a time when most most people really didn't have much to do. So reading the Bible was something that was was very well attended to because it was something that not only passed the time, but it helped to grow in life and faith. But now we are inundated with so much information, so much technology, so much stuff that we have to be intentional about how we spend our time. So reading the Bible is an important thing to do. So I would encourage you to have a Bible open before you. This sets a precedent. It kind of helps you to, you know, set a, a pattern of behavior, set a pattern of belief. Again, and It doesn't matter whether it's a paraphrase or translation or whatever, just as long as you have the Bible open before you and you're reading it. Uh, And um, it can be a digital, it can be a paperback. Uh, That is is not the primary intent, as long as it's open. Uh, If you can. Now, if you're listening to this while you're working out or while you're walking the dog or while you're driving the car, obviously you can't do that. And that's okay. It's okay if you don't have the Bible open. But if if at all possible, I would definitely recommend that you do that. It's, It's a far better experience experience as you're going through it. Plus you get to read along uh, and follow along and see how the words work. You know, sometimes, sometimes words are presented to us and we, um, we don't necessarily follow the words. We think that we know them, but it, it's, it's far better we can, when we can actually read them because sometimes our, our culture, our world, our teaching has introduced things into the Bible that just aren't there. I mean, there's a couple of them, you know, the, like the, the idea of God helps those who help themselves. Well, there's something similar to that within the Bible, but those words are not actually from the Bible. Those words are from Benjamin Franklin. 
So it would be terrible to speak to someone who's down and out and and say, you know, the Bible says God's the, God helps those who help themselves when actually it's Benjamin Franklin who says that, not the Bible. So so we want to make sure that we're clear about what the Bible says. The other one is, you know, God doesn't give us any more than we can handle. Uh, again, there's something very similar to that said in the Bible, but not that. That's not said in the Bible. Uh, God doesn't overwhelm us. God doesn't give us, uh, God, God doesn't stretch us beyond our gifts and capabilities, but there's a lot of things that we can't handle by ourselves. Uh, and that's one of the things that we need to learn about our own path and our own journey is that there are a lot of things that God doesn't give us. Th- th- there are a lot of things that, that we face that we can't handle alone. And that doesn't necessarily mean that God even gave it to us. I mean, sometimes God just doesn't stop things from getting in our way. Uh, sometimes God just allow things to happen as they're happening rather than intervening, uh, depending on where we are in a life of faith, where we are in our relationship, where we are in our interaction. I was talking to someone not too long ago about how this works. And, and you know, I mean, it, it, it's like a boulder rolling down the hill. Well, um, God has the capability of intervening and just tapping that boulder away so it doesn't run us over. But there needs to be, you know, but, but why would God do that if there isn't a commitment or if there isn't an interaction, if the relationship isn't, isn't there? I don't think a lot of people expect God to respond to them and do for them, but they won't do for God. And that's not how it works. It's not a, a relationship is, is twofold. So, so I would definitely encourage you to read the Bible, have it open before you, know what's going on, be part of the relationship, be part of the work that we're doing together. And part of the call of being a Christian, obviously, is to share the word. So get the word out there. Get it out there for others to follow. You know, share this on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, share it out there on, um, on, on YouTube. You can direct message it. You can, um, you know, you can email it, uh, anything like that. So get it out there so that other people know what's going on and know how it works. Okay. So that's, that's what I would encourage you. That's what I would encourage uh, for you to do uh, is to work that way. Okay. So, so uh, we're in the gospel of Mark. Mark is the second book of the new Testament. Old Testament tells the story of God, it's creation up to the birth of Jesus, new Testament, birth of Jesus, all the way up to the recreation of the world. And uh, so we're in the New Testament, second book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So that's where we're at. And we're in the fourth chapter right now. So I would encourage you again to have a Bible open before you so you can follow along and you can see the words and you can hear and and look as I'm reading along so that you have an idea and so you can really grasp what is taking place. So we are now what in many would call the parable section or the revelation section of the gospel of Mark. Mark really, Mark breaks down into two primary sections, the revelation section, the parable, the teaching section, and then the the passion, crucifixion, resurrection section. So we just come out of like the first three chapters where we're really learning about who Jesus is. Jesus is building his street credibility. Jesus is calling his disciples, starting to set the path. Why should we listen to this guy? Well, we saw that, you know, he squared off against the Pharisees and scribes. He did some healings. He did some curings. Um, he did some other things that, that really show that this guy is the son of God. And that's what we want. So now, as, as we've proven that this guy is a son of God. His authenticity and authority has been proven. Now that's why we should listen to him. Why should we listen to him? Because he's proven over and over that he is the one who represents God, that he is from God. He is the son of God. So then we move into this time called what we would know as a parable section. Jesus tells these different parables. Last week, we had the parable of the sower and the explanation of really who Jesus is in the world and how Jesus is supposed to work in the world. So the parable of the sower is the first main parable in the gospel of Mark. And we're going to carry on those parables. We're going to get more and different things that, that, um, that Jesus brings to the table. So so he finishes up with the parable of the sower, and then we pick up in, in chapter 4, verse 21 and following. He said to them, this is Jesus, Jesus said to them, is a lamp brought in and put under the bushel basket or under the bed and not on the lampstand? For there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed, nor is anything secret except to come to light. Let anyone with ears hear, listen. With, let anyone with ears to hear, listen. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. The measure you will give, the measure you give will be the measure you get, and still more will be given to you. 
For those who have, more will be given. For those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Okay, so so these are these are little pieces of wisdom. These are little pieces of parables, um, and they point to not only you know kind of common practice, but they also point to the nature of God's work in the world, and they point to the nature of Christ in the world. So he lays out a few things here that really point to his nature. The first thing he lays out is the lamp, the understanding. He would consider himself the lamp. Now, remember in the Gospel of John. Jesus is more fully talked about as the light of the world, the light that comes to pierce the darkness. This is John's language. This is how John talks about everything. Uh, you know, light, darkness, bread of life, water, all that kind of stuff. So that's not what Mark really doesn't go as much into that. However, Jesus is referring to himself as kind of a lamp. And he says, look, when you light a lamp, would you light a lamp and then hide it under a bushel basket? Well, no, that would be that would be stupid because one, when you light a lamp, you want as most as, as much light out there as possible. That's why you have lampstands. Okay, in the Old Testament, there were lampstands. And in the book of Revelation, you know, the angel to the churches talks about a lampstand. But a lampstand, you put you light a light and then you put it up on the stand so that it illumines and it kind of throws light up and light filters down. Think about it this way. You know, where do you ha- you, you have a lamp? Well, do you put a lamp on the floor? Well, not unless you're looking, either looking for something on the floor or working on the floor. No, you put a lamp up on a table, or maybe you have a floor lamp that stands a good four feet off the ground so that it throws light out into the room. That is the point. So anybody knows if you have a lamp, you don't hide the light. I mean, not only are you not lighting up the room, which is what the whole point of the light is, but also you're wasting valuable energy. You know, it, it, it's one thing, you know, in our world today, you know, you turn a light bulb on and, and, and it burns all day and you really don't, you really don't pay attention to it. You know, maybe you change a light bulb once a year, twice a year, but you don't necessarily think, oh, if I would have turned this light off three hours ago, this light bulb would have lasted longer. No, it, light is such a disposable thing in our world. It really truly is. Um, and, and, and we've become so accustomed to having light available all the time. But in the ancient world, light was not a disposable thing. If you lit a lamp, you wanted to take advantage of every drop of that light because one, it was expensive. You know, you had to use some kind of alternative fuel, whale oil or some kind of other oil, uh, some kind of purified olive oil or something that burned in order to make the lamp work. But then you had other things. You had wicks, you had um, all kinds of stuff that you didn't want to waste. Again, we are so blessed in our world today to have such disposable light. I mean, looking around me right now as I'm recording this, I've got a major light overhead, plus I have a light on my desk that that is illuminating the scriptures that I'm reading from. Uh, And and I don't think about it. I mean, this light over my head's been on all day. I got here in the office this morning, turn it on, it'll be on until I leave this afternoon. I don't think about what it's going to cost or, you know, maybe I should turn it off in order to save the bulb for another year. That's not how we function in our world today. But in the ancient world, you didn't light a lamp and then hide it. If you wanted to hide the light, you'd put the lamp out. You don't hide the light. The light is exposed. Well, you know, and and so Jesus is paralleling this idea, of course, and and nobody's going to put a a lit lamp under the bed. You know, if you put it under a bushel basket or on the bed, not only are you wasting the light and wasting it, you're risking a fire. (laughs) You know, you you don't want to set the place on fire by putting a light under a combustible element like a bed or a bushel basket or anything else like that. So with that being said, you know, Jesus is using this vision, this idea to give an analogy about himself. I'm sure at many times people would tell him to be quiet, quiet down, shut up, don't push the barrier, don't push the don't push the legal, you know, don't push the edge, don't upset the apple cart. We hear this all the time. We hear this from visionaries, don't upset the apple cart, don't upset the system. You know, don't push too far. Well, I'm sure that there are probably those around him who are telling him. I mean, remember that when he went home and the crowds gathered and his family heard about it, they went out to restrain him. They went out to restrain him because they were afraid that something was going to happen, um, that, that he had gone out of his mind. So Jesus is like, look, if I'm the sower, if I've come down to sow the word of God, if I've come down to expose the light of God to the world, why would you put that light under a bushel basket? Why would you hide that light under systems and control and, and temple cult and following the rules? Why wouldn't you say, we're not going to do that? We're not going to hide this light. 
I've come to be the light of the world. I'm the lamp on the lampstand. And if you go to, if, if we go to, to the book of Revelation, which I talked about earlier, you know, there's many references as the light on the lampstand or the lamp on the lampstand. The idea that the lampstand is the church and the light is Christ. And it is on the, the lampstand of the church that the light of Christ rests. So what Jesus is saying here is, look, it doesn't make any sense to, to, to bring the light into the world, me, and then hide it. And then hide it so that it never reveals its light. Because the light is always going to be there. There's nothing that is hidden, okay? And and this is an important this is an important idea. So so let's kind of understand how people saw God. People didn't see God as all knowing, okay? They didn't see God as omniscient, all knowing, all seeing, all believing, all present. All right? Um, God had limits. All right? God was tied up or cooped up in the holy of holies, and God only knew what you brought to God. That was the belief structure. So now all of a sudden Jesus is saying, look, there's nothing that's hidden that isn't going to be revealed. God knows everything. It's going to be seen. You will be seen. Things will be seen. You can't hide this. As much as you want to try, you can't hide this. You can't hide the reality of your life. Even if you try to hide the lamp underneath the bushel basket, I'm still going to see. God's knowledge of you, God's understanding of you is so deep and so rich that it's going to be revealed. Don't bother trying to hide it. Don't bother trying to cover it up. You might as well be open about it. So this idea is at the same time very scary, but also very freeing. Okay, very scary, but also very freeing. You know, Jesus says in the Gospel of John, you, you know, the truth, you, you know, the truth and the truth will set you free. When we speak the truth, the truth sets us free. We don't have to carry the burden of the lie. We don't have to carry the burden of fear. We don't have to carry the burden of, of misinformation. If we're in the presence of someone who knows our truth, then we don't have to craft a lie. And that is a beautiful, freeing thing. But it's also very scary because we don't always know what people are going to do with that truth once they have it. And that's the scary part. What will someone do with my truth once they have it? Now, when we're talking about God, we're talking about a very benevolent, caring, grace-filled being who already knows our truth. So it's not like we can be like, oh, well, I mean, I'm going to hide my truth from God. God already knows our truth. God knows what's going on inside of us. So there's no reason for us to try to hide that truth in any way. There's no reason for us to try to make that truth to be less than or difficult because God already knows the truth that resides inside of us. God already knows what's going on. God already knows what's happening. But Jesus is making it clear that anything hidden will be revealed. Anything that we um, anything that, that, that we think, you know, we've got hidden, uh, expect to be disclosed. Nor is anything secret um, expect to come to light. Let anyone with ears to hear listen. So, so whatever is hidden, I mean, the light of Christ is going to reveal all shadow, all darkness, all corner, all everything. Nothing is going to be hidden from the Christ. And this, again, is a really incredible thing, but also a really, really scary thing. Because when we produce our vulnerability, when we lay our vulnerability out there, that's a very scary portion for us because we don't know what people are going to do with that. We don't know what people are going to do with our vulnerability, let alone a God who once our sins are out there, could squash us like a grape or a bug or whatever. You know, so what we need to see here is that Jesus is not only setting a new path about who he's supposed to be and why he shouldn't be hidden, but he's also indicating the fact that things that are hidden, they will come to light. There is no hidden in God. There is no secrets in God. There's nothing that can be hidden from God's purpose and understanding. That is a huge thing for us to grasp. That is a huge thing for us to understand. There's nothing hidden from God. God's purpose, God's understanding, God's ability to see everything, to know everything. It's all there. God cannot and will not be fooled. Okay, and that's what Jesus is saying. He, you know, he's making it very clear. You don't light a lamp and you hide it any more than you bring the Messiah into the world and then tuck him into a corner, pull him aside because everybody thinks he's cuckoo birds. You know, you, you let him do his thing. And that's what he says. You let me do my thing. And he also said, pay attention to what you hear. The measure you give will be the measure you get and still more will be given you. 
For to those who have, more will be given, and those who have nothing, even what they have, will be taken away. Okay, so so let's be clear. Let's be clear about a couple of things here. We need to connect all that together. Jesus says, pay attention to what you hear. Now, I love this. I really do. Um, and, and I really... I really think the church um, and and the constituency and the membership really need to dwell on this because we hear so much and a lot of it is hate filled, power filled, greed filled. Turn on the news and you'll hear an agenda depending on what channel you're on. And we all know this. If if you don't know this by now, then I'm sorry to have to be the bearer of such bad news. But it is true. Every news station has an agenda and their agenda is tied to political ties or conservative or liberal or whatever, whatever way you want to walk. So we have to be very careful what we hear. We have to be very careful about what we allow into our ears. We have to pay attention. We can't just blindly allow whatever to come into our ears, because when we do that, we can believe some crazy things. We can believe some really unfaithful things. We can accept some really unfaithful things as true. And that's what and 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 that's where this is going. Okay. The measure you give will be the measure you get. All right. So if you measure, if if you if you give good, then good is going to return to you. Okay. If you pour forth it, it, it would be foolish to think that you can speak terribly to someone and that they're going to praise you. That's not how it works. If you speak terribly to someone, they're going to pray. They're going to speak terrible to you in return. If you get in someone's face and start yelling at them, they're not going to, you know, hug you and love you and give you Hershey's kisses. They're probably going to yell back. You cannot expect to be treated differently than how you treat someone else. And that's a really important lesson. Unfortunately, that's a lesson that we should be taught young in life, but many generations are not taught that. So now we have people who are treating others badly and then expecting expecting that they're going to get treated well in return, which is really, really funny. It really, really is truly funny when people treat others badly and then can't figure out why they get bad treatment in return. I'm always very fascinated by seeing that, that, you know, I'm going to yell at you, but then when you yell back, you can't yell at me. You can't, oh yeah, well, if you're going to yell at me, I'm going to yell at you, you know. So you give what you get. The measure you give is the measure you get, okay? So, so, so you know, and, and, and still more will be given to you. And, and it really is true. I mean, if I treat someone well, then, then they're going to treat me well in return, hopefully e- expecting to be treated well in return, but also that then others are going to see that and they're going to respond as well also. So, so there is a kind of a domino effect that happens here. But if you treat someone badly, uh, if I treated someone badly and, and other people saw it, I'd be treated badly, not only by that person, but those around them. That's how it works. If you treat badly, you get bad in return. And, and that's how it is. It doesn't, it doesn't work any other way. It doesn't work any other circumstance. So if you treat someone badly, you will get treated badly in return. If you treat someone well, most likely you'll get treated well in return. That's how this process goes about. And that's what we want to see happen uh, throughout the whole thing. That's what we want to see happen throughout the, the life. And that's what Jesus wants to see. So pay attention to what you hear. Pay attention to what you hear. Notice in in the way it's written, pay attention to what you hear, semicolon. So it's almost like two different thoughts wrapped together. Pay attention to what you hear and pay attention to what you give because what you give, you're going to get in return. The measure you give will be the measure you get. You reap what you sow. You know, these are all similar ideas and and, and very important because somewhere along the line, um, and I think you can probably trace it back to Cain and Abel, Cain kills Abel. Uh, Cain commits this act of killing Abel, but then he's surprised when God is going to punish him. Like, well, I don't deserve this. Uh, yeah, you do. Yeah, you did something really, really awful, and you deserve it. So from there on, it's like I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to reap what I sow. And God's like, no, you reap what you sow. This is all part of accountability in life. And Jesus, Jesus didn't come to abolish the law; He came to fulfill it. So Jesus is all about, you know, accountability. You, you will be held accountable for what you've done. We have to caveat that with grace. We have to caveat that with grace because grace says what you've done isn't going to exclude you from eternity, but you still have to pay the price. And those are very important details. You still have to pay the price. What you what you have to do is you have to pay the price. Uh, you have to pay the price for what you did, even if you um, even if you still have a, a maintain or attain um, eternity. Uh, and and then he goes on. For those who have will be given more. 
and from those who have nothing, even what you have, even what they have will be taken away. Okay, so we want to think like like money and power, but Jesus is responding far more about God. Those who have connection to God, more will be given. More will be given because you see God, you interact with God, you learn from God, you study God, you follow God, you speak God, you, you preach God, 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 God. The more you have God, the more you see God, the more you know God, the more God is present in your life and in your work and in your interaction and your activity. So the more you have God, the more the more you see God. Whereas in return, for those who don't have God, for those who don't see God, they're not going to in the small things in the day, they're not going to see God in the big things. They're not going to see God present in the, in the big things if they can't see God present in the small things. So what they if they don't have it, they're going to lose even the big stuff. So even the, even the big shot in the sky stuff is going to be taken away. We want to transpose this into thinking it's about stuff stuff like house and car and job and, and beauty and power. And that's not what Jesus is talking about. If you look at it coupled together with everything else that's being said here, it's all about connection to the Savior and connection to God and connection to Christ. So for those who have more will be given and that have is the have of a relationship with christ a relationship with god for those who have a relationship that relationship will be enhanced it won't just be um it won't just be stagnant relationships are never stagnant they're growing or declining that's how relationships are so the relationship won't be stagnant it's either growing or declining depending on where people are at and those who don't have, those who don't have a relationship, well, then even what they don't, even the possibility of seeing something big and huge will be taken away because they won't see it. Again, and, and, and this isn't necessarily, um, this, this isn't necessarily God taking it away, but their own pride, their own prejudice, their own um, arrogance, their own lack of desire, their own lack of growth, their own lack of support. That's all, that's all being, that's all them taking it away themselves. This isn't God coming in necessarily taking things away. This is them losing what they have uh, because they, uh, because of their lack of desire, because of their lack of willingness to submit and grow and find humility and grace. So that stuff goes away, not because God comes along and pops it out of their lives, but because they just don't want it in their life to begin with. Uh, It doesn't have value. And that which doesn't have value in our life, we don't invest in. And if we don't invest in it sooner or later, it what? just goes away. It does. It just goes away. We don't have it anymore. It just just disappears. It becomes um, anemic. It it loses life. It shrivels and dies um, is is what it does. So so we have this, you know, this reality, this uh, this experience. And that's what Jesus says. Jesus says, look, I mean, this is where it's at. And this is what's going on. So, um, you know, this is part of being in me and part of being in life in in how things work out. So so that's where uh, that's where he's at in these little kind of quips of wisdom, these little bits of knowledge and pieces of information. He also goes on. This is verse 26. He also said the kingdom of God is if someone scattered seed on the ground and would sleep and rise day and night and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. Okay, so so this is a, a, um, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a good amount of debate. There's always a goodly amount of debate when it comes to the word of God and the work of God and everything else. How does this work? How do we do this? How does God's kingdom work? And this portion of the parable, this wisdom, this peace, this is basically Jesus saying, look, it happens. Don't necessarily spend all of your time trying to figure out the process because you don't have to. You don't have to figure out how the grain works. The, the, seed, the seed is scattered, and once the seed is scattered, then the earth does its work. The earth produces of itself. The earth knows how to do what the earth knows how to do. I think one of the challenges that we as humans have, and this, is, this has been something that, you know, come through the centuries, through the ages. Uh, Luther talks about it in, the, in his sacramental theology, and I'll, I'll touch on it here in a minute. But I, I think that we, we as humans spend far too much time trying to figure out how something works and not enough time actually doing what we're supposed to do with that which works or that which we already know how to do. I think we can we can occupy ourselves so fully with how does, you know, how does God produce A, B, and C? Um, and we can occupy ourselves with that idea, but at the same time, then we're not actually fulfilling the call that God has for us to go out and change the world or 
whatever. You know, Martin Luther, taught, when we talk about the uh, our sacramental theology, you know, as Lutherans, we are not transubstantiationists. We don't believe in the, you know, that the bread and wine totally transform into the body and blood or are we what would be called consubstantiation which is similar but not quite the same that says you know it's both body and blood and bread and wine we are real presence people so we believe that christ is in with and under the bread and wine which then produces the sacramental reality now how does that work luther says we don't know and it doesn't really matter for us to figure it out. Our job is to believe it and actually do the things that God has called us to do, which is to proclaim the kingdom, love the, you know, love our neighbors, feed the hungry, care for the poor, be, visit the imprisoned and the sick. So if we spend all of our time, if we spend all of our time trying to figure out how something works, then we're not going to actually do what we are supposed to do. And that's kind of what this parable says. It's like, look, we know the kingdom of God is if someone would scatter the seed on the ground and would sleep in, and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. He doesn't need to know how. Notice Jesus doesn't give a, a lecture on, on agriculture. Jesus says, look, the earth produces as it does. The earth knows what to do. The kingdom of God knows what to do. It is your job not to try to figure out what the kingdom of God has to do. It's not your job to figure out how God works. It's your job to do what God has asked you to do. And that is to care for the hungry, to feed the hungry and clothe the naked and shelter the homeless and care for the sick and visit the imprisoned. To love your neighbor as yourself. That's the call. So how does the kingdom of God work? Well, the point is we're not supposed to know how the kingdom of God works. That's not for us to know. But all throughout the centuries, people have spent thousands of hours trying to figure out how God works as if it is a faithful approach to the kingdom. And actually it's not because you're not doing the work that God has called you to do. Who cares how, you know, and really it should be, I mean, who cares? It's, it's not as important about how God has gotten here. It's, it's more important that God has gotten here and it's our job to proclaim and move and grow. That's how it works. So that's what Jesus is saying here. You know, when we don't have to figure out how the, the grain ripens, we just have to go to work when the grain ripens to actually do something with it. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes out with a sickle because the harvest has come. He plants the seed, lets the earth do what the earth does, and then harvests the grain. He doesn't try to figure out how the grain grows. He lets the earth do that. That's the farmer. Uh, he lets the earth do that, and then he goes out and does the work of harvesting after the earth has done its thing. So the kingdom of God has a great deal of mystery in it. And that's one of the great things is that's one of the, the powerful points and the great things is the kingdom of God has great mystery to it. It is not our job to figure out or to attain the mystery of the kingdom. It is our job to trust that the mystery of the kingdom is for our benefit and that we want it and that we want to hold on to it. It is our job to grasp the mystery of the kingdom and not spend all of our time trying to figure out the mystery of the kingdom because we'll exhaust ourselves at the end of the day and go, well, what have we gained? We haven't gained anything. We've gained nothing by figuring out the mystery of the kingdom. The mystery of the kingdom is still the mystery of the kingdom. We don't know anything. I mean, we haven't advanced any. We just filled ourselves with more knowledge. Uh, the, the hungry are still hungry. The poor are still poor. The naked are still naked. We haven't done anything to fix it. We have just done all we can to figure out how it is. And that is not what God wants. God does not need us to figure out the kingdom. God needs us to represent the kingdom. Big, huge, powerful difference. God does not need us to figure out the kingdom. God's already got the kingdom figured out. God doesn't need us to figure out the Eucharist. God's already got that figured out. God needs us to believe. So he continues on. This is verse 30. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable can we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all seeds of the earth. Yet when it's sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can nest in its shade. All right. So for any of any of you who have walked with the scriptures and walked with faith, you've heard the mustard seed parable that the kingdom of God is so small, but as it grows, it grows to something exponentially bigger. And that is true, the mustard seed. If you've never seen a mustard seed, um, then you'll know that it, it, the mustard seed is a very small seed. But when it grows, it grows into a quite a big shrub. The mustard shrub is big. Uh, so something so small planted in the right way can grow into something so big. So the kingdom of God can grow exponentially in the soil of a believer's heart. That's the statement. That's the word. That's the work of the kingdom to grow exponentially exponentially in the heart of the believer, in the heart of, of the good soil, 
as Jesus would talk about uh, earlier in the parable, the kingdom of God grows exponentially. Um, it grows, you know, when it's sown in the ground, it grows up. Now, a mustard seed in a, in a jar does nothing. It needs to be sown in good soil. It needs to be sown in the ground. But there's a couple other things about the mustard seed. John Dominic Cross and uh, the, 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 great the, the great modern theologian, uh, the great modern Catholic theologian, you know, talks about this parable and he talks about, uh, you know, that, that the mustard seed is also insidious. It, you can't get rid of it. Uh, once a mustard shrub grows, you can't get rid of it. And that, you know, the kingdom of God, when sown in the heart of someone, even if it is dormant, even if it is not celebrated or practiced, you can't get rid of it. You can't just undo mustard seed growth. The mustard seed, when the kingdom of God gets in someone's life, it stays there. Even if it is dormant, it stays there. You can't purge yourself of God's work. So the kingdom of God is, it's penetrating and it's small, but it grows into something huge and it just doesn't go away. You can't undo it. You can't get it out. Now here, here where I, where I live and many of you, um, you know, we don't have mustard shrubs per se, but we've got these little prickly things called thistles. Now, I call them thistles. Uh, this is what Eeyore ate, you know, in the hundred acre woods. But when you pull them out of the ground, they have these little like hair like roots, little fibers that stick to the, the one root that goes straight down. And if you leave just one little piece of hairy fiber from the root structure, it'll grow back. You, they're almost impossible to get rid of. I've got a couple of batches of of thistle, and and I just I'm just pulling them out all year. They're they're such a pain, uh, because they never go away. You know, I'd spray them and pull them and spray them and pull them, and they keep coming back, keep coming back, because I can't get all of it out. Well, a mustard seed is like that. A mustard plant is like that. The shrub, once it grows, um, you can't get rid of it. It won't go away. So the kingdom of God, you know, what Jesus is saying is that the kingdom of God is something planted very small in fertile soil grows up to be something very huge. And you really can't get rid of it. You can't purge the kingdom of God out of your life once it's in you. You may hate it. You may not practice it. You may not celebrate, but it's always there. It's always part of who you are. Part of your baptism is, you know, your baptism is your baptism. You may deny it or turn away from it, but you can't wash yourself from it. You can't wash it away. It's always going to be there. It's always going to be part of your identity. It's always going to be part of your fabric, even if you don't want it to be. And that's a powerful and important thing to realize. So so it, it puts forth large branches uh, so that the birds of the air can make nests in it. And Jesus says that because he wants to be clear about how big the, the shrub is. You know, it's not like a hosta that grows on the ground. And I mean, hostas can get pretty big, but they're not sturdy enough for birds of the air to put branches in or put nests in. No, it, it's about something different. It's a big, it's a shrub that is capable of housing uh, the most vulnerable, the birds of the air and the such. So, so the kingdom of God, so he uses this parable talking about the mustard seed and everybody would have been familiar with the mustard plant. Oh yeah. Everybody knows what the pl- mustard plant is. Absolutely. That's just how it works. Every, everybody knows what the mustard plant is and how the mustard plant grows. So Jesus is speaking very earthy to the people where they are at the time. That's important to understand about how Jesus does it. So he wraps up this, this little section here. So this is verse 35. Uh, or 33 to 35 Uh, with many such parables he spoke to the the word to them as they were able to hear it but he did not speak to them except in parables but he explained everything in private to his disciples so jesus speaks in parables to the people because he trusts that that's the way they can understand and grasp what he's talking about Uh, the disciples he spends more time with and so because he spends more time with them he's able to explain them and teach them and help them to grow but for the people that he interacts with he speaks in parables Parables, uh, because parables are easier for them to understand. He uses imagery and visualization that works for them. Uh, so that's what Jesus does. But he speaks to the disciples. He's more direct and he explains things because that's more important uh, because they're going to be the ones ultimately that will carry on this mission, this ministry after he is gone. They don't know that yet, but they'll figure it out as time goes on.
Okay, so that's what I got for you. That's where we're going to stop for today uh, because we're going to move into a new section here with the with the next portion. And I don't I don't want to jump into uh, anything like that. I want to make sure that we get plenty of time for it. So as I said before, if this is important, if you get something out of this, please share it out there. Please put it out on your Facebook, your Instagram feed. I'd love to uh, see where you're at. So tag me in it. If you have any questions or any thoughts, my um, my contact information will come up at the end of the session. Please feel free to reach out to me. I would love to do anything I can to help you uh, understand more fully or if there's something that I can clarify. I'll either try to do it in the next session or I'll reach out to you directly. But either way, I'd love to hear from you. So once again, thank you for being part of this. Thank you for spending your time. Thank you for spending part of your energy with me. It's a joy to be here. God bless you and we'll talk to you next week.